wanted to introduce uh, Liam Wright, uh, the speaker of the day. So thank you, Liam, for being the first speaker this uh, semester. Uh, the talks are always amazing. The first talk is always amazing this semester, so I hope we won't be disappointed. Uh, I'm just teasing you. Uh, Liam uh, works at, uh, in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, some of you may know him because he uh, started here, did his PhD at uh, Carnegie Mellon University with Kevin Solman a few years ago. He works on a range of area of philosophy of science, formal and social epistemology and Africana philosophy. He has been very influential in, uh, uh, on some of these topics. Um, um, and he has published uh, in all the best uh, journals in philosophy of science and as well. It's, I mean, it's actually not a joke, it's actually a true fact about you, about you, Liam. Uh, you know, philosophy of science, BGPS, and so on and so forth, on topics such as fraud, peer review, um, and issues related to the social epistemology of, of, of science. Uh, particularly noteworthy is the fact that his 2017 paper in Philosophical Studies on fraud was selected to be one of, as one of the best 10 papers of the year and was published in the 2017 Philosopher's Annual. His uh, most recent paper, so that is the, most, the one I've read most recently, is on peer review. Is peer review a good idea just published in Philosophy of Science? And I, I quite agree with, with him about um, what he says in, in, in that paper, Abolish Peer Review. All right, uh, that's uh, about it as an introduction. Liam, the floor is, is yours. You have about 50 minutes. Okay, hi, hi everyone. No, I actually suspect that the talk might actually come in a bit under, so that will give us more time for everyone to ask me sort of nice chill questions that in no way prog me or I mean, because it's Friday night. I don't need that in my life, be chill. Okay, so my talk is about all well, the titles, the conclusion. Scientific conclusions need not be accurate, justified, or believed by their authors. Um, before we get going properly, I should say it's a co-authored work. Oh, naturally, it's not working. Oh, there it is. Um, with Hai Sin Dang. Hai Sin Dang is the one on the left. See, the other good thing about this format is I can just assume all my jokes are landing. You will love me. It's going great. I love it. I like this. Um, okay, so Hai Sin Dang, the one on the left, uh, she's actually the first author, and she is a former Pitt HPS graduate. She's um, she got her PhD at HPS, um, and not only is she she's first author, but actually it's, it's kind of relevant here because there's a there's a in the paper this is based on there's a case study, there's a historical case study, which um, was really, that was really high sin's work. I don't know it in as much detail, so I won't really be able to answer questions about the case study as much. I apologize for that in advance. But the good thing for this audience is that case study, this is kind of the thing which inspired the work as a whole in many ways, um, was actually based on high sin's um, comp. It was based on her work that she did to get through the degree program in HPS. So if it's bad, it's your fault really. And so you definitely can't ask questions. Um, so I accept no responsibilities for any errors. And in fact, I blame you, the audience. Okay, so um, before uh, getting into the meat of the paper, the, the talk about like the, the big picture here. So like, what's the sort of the thing which got Hysin and I thinking about this? And so you can you think of like the big picture question, something like, what are we licensed to infer from the fact that something appears as a conclusion to a published article when all is going well? I'm going to say a bit more, define some of those terms in a moment. But the reason, but like what we're thinking about here is kind of like science is a is a big process. And so on the whole, we want to be able to, to trust what comes out of it. But for the big process to work and for the big process to reach trustworthy conclusions, it requires lots and lots of mini inputs, so like the science as a whole, and then there's particular labs or particular researchers putting out their individual work. And, and we're sort of interested in what's the relationship between the whole and the part, like, like how, how, did a, how did the miniature, the, the subunits contribute to the success or failure of the enterprise considered broadly? Um, and in particular, actually, uh, we got to think about this because of the replication crisis. Um, because uh, often we were kind of interested in thinking, often not seem to be happening in some, not in every case. I mean, there were many, many causes of replication crisis. We're not gonna say this is the only one, but one of the things that seem to be going on 
is you would get people, for instance, starting consultancies based on published papers they were just, just, just doing in psychology. And it was sort of like rushing straight from, or you just published a paper or two studying this phenomena to like giving seminars to businesses and charging money for it. And then this contributed both to the reality and the perception of a replication crisis when it turns out many things thus, thus rushed through didn't really work. Um, and that got us to, got us thinking about this, this question of the replication crisis, which is, um, you know, why is it a crisis, right? Like, you know, is, is at least some of the issue, and there are many issues, I said, it's really not the whole thing, but is at least some of the issue uh, something like, um, not so much like what the point say is at least some of the issue like what we're expecting from science in the first place like why would it be a crisis for papers which are like just published not to turn out to replicate like what's the expected rate of replication how many of such things should work so at least some of the issue might be something to do with our attitude to the particular published units in science and so that was a kind of was never a motivating factor so pardon me um so to define terms a bit more precisely. Um, what I mean when all is going well. So this is some idealizing assumptions for the sake of the talk. Um, but in the Q&A, if you want to ask nicely about these, happy to talk more. Um, so when all is going well, we're going to be thinking about like cases where the scientific community is well arranged to bring about desirable epistemic results. So we're imagining that like whatever like the individual process as a whole, if the individual units do their part, then science will achieve knowledge or truth or empirical adequacy or whatever it is we want science as a whole to achieve. And so, you know, it, it could happen that the scientific community is just so badly set up that no matter what the individual units do, it doesn't really matter because the whole, the whole enterprise is, is badly conducted. And that might happen with some fields, like maybe, What's the phrenology, the one where they thing up your head? Like, you know, maybe that was a field like that where it just didn't really matter how careful you were of your skull measurements. It just was never going to be good. But we're not thinking about cases like that. Assume it's a sort of basically well-run enterprise achieving sort of desirable epistemic goals. And secondly, let's assume that the conclusion that's been reached, the thing we're going to be interested in, um, are cases where the researcher hasn't committed fraud, they followed the best practices, they haven't made any silly errors. And so insofar as this thing has been concluded, it's the result of like someone working according to the standards of a field in a field where it's generally doing okay, uh, achieving epistemic goals. And so any problems you might have with the conclusion, any sort of lack of epistemic status is not because either the field or the subunit are just mistakes or errors or done poorly or something like that. They're trying to think about like the good case. Okay, so that's what we mean by that. Um, and our idea here, when we got thinking about this, was to sort of borrow um, work that's been done in analytic philosophy of language and analytic epistemology, where people have been really been thinking about like norms which govern when assertions can be made. And so the thought is, is that um, well, there are lots of different proposed norms, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the thought is, yeah, when I assert something about how the world is, uh, um, it, for it to be a felicitous assertion, maybe even for it to count as the thing which is assertion, it has to be sort of held to certain kind of norms. And if it's a good one, achieve those norms. And so maybe, for instance, a good assertion is a true assertion. In that case, it's kind of failed qua assertion if I say something and it's false. Or maybe if it's not the kind of thing which has to at least try to be true, then it doesn't count as an assertion or something like that. And so our thought was that like maybe the conclusion of scientific papers like could be seen as like what the paper is asserting about the world. And so, you know, if you have a paper on the sociology of mobile phone use in a city and it concludes that in, in 2007 there was an uptick in mobile phone use. Um, then that, you know, what the paper has done is like, in the end, try to like assert this about the world, um, the, that uh, mobile phone use has gone up in, in this particular year. Um, and it's done so, and it has like an argument to justify that. Um, that was kind of our first guess um, proposal. And, you know, it turns out we can argue that that doesn't work. But we thought it was a fairly natural first guess. And so like, it's interesting to learn that it fails. And also, you'll see that uh, why it fails is kind of informative about the relationship between the subjects and the whole. Um, oh yeah, so this is just to be a bit precise about what's meant by um, assertion. 
because there are, uh, sorry about conclusion of scientific paper, we call them public avowals or scientific public avowals, actually that's really important. So you can say utterance is made by scientists aimed at informing the wider scientific community of some result obtained. So this can be conclusions in peer reviewed papers, um, conference presentations or posters, online preprints, that sort of thing. And I, and I think two things, it could be like marked out as the conclusion, often such things will feature in the abstract or the results section of the paper, I mean, both inclusive or might also always inclusive. Um, and actually importantly, we are thinking, despite the somewhat misleading thing I did where I began with like someone talking to a business cons consultancy, for now, we're gonna be thinking specifically about scientists talking to other scientists. So like the presumed audience for this kind of thing is whoever reads the journals in my field or um, whoever turns up to a conference in my field or something like that. And the reason it's gonna matter is because given what we're gonna say, we think it might, might actually be reasonable to hold a sort of like outward facing, public facing utterances to different standards. And so it's kind of like, that, that's where we wanna focus for now. Okay, so there's, here's the, the argument of what's gonna follow. I said, I don't actually think it's gonna to take too long. So hopefully we can all um, chill soon. Okay, so first I'm gonna examine that case study, um, which I mentioned that was based on Hyacinth's work. I'll just kind of really briefly summarize it, but it will sort of give you an example of the sort of thing we have in mind. And then I'll think about how to generalize from that, or like what, what sort of mechanisms are at play there, which allow for what happened to happen. And then I will consider an objection, just one, but it's the only sensible one, so do that. So we'll think about that objection, and then we'll conclude that we're right and you'll agree and it will be good okay um so how to start now okay there is one more thing a lot of lot of, lot of cell this is good because it's all gonna like fall into place it's be very natural you're gonna like it okay so i mentioned we're gonna look from the literature we looked at the literature and active um, epistemology on these norms of assertion well we claim as far as we could tell we've shown this sentence epistemologist they didn't tend to agree that broadly speaking, roughly the, the, the popular ones, the ones people take seriously, as far as we can tell, they usually or mostly or maybe always fall into one of three categories. Um, they both appear at once, okay. So some of them are factive. I mentioned maybe an assertion's uh, apt or felicitous only if it is true. So um, obviously you could just say good assertions have to be true. But another example of that might be good assertions have to be known given that knowledge is factive. Um, I think the knowledge norm is probably the most, the individually most popular um, and widely accepted. And I think Timothy Williamson made it famous, but, um, but you know, there are other ways you could build in. So I, Jason Stanley at least mooted for discussion once a norm saying that you have to, something has to be known and certain in the right kind of way or whatever, as long as they entail that a good assertion has to be true, then it counts as a factive one. Sometimes people have slightly weaker constraints where they say, an assertion has to be at least justified, but maybe maybe false. And um, so in these kind of cases, like if as long as I'm warranted in making the assertion or my evidence would justify it if I were to think rationally in the right kind of way or something like that, then the assertion can be apt and it can be apt even if it's not in fact true. What, what matters is I have the right kind of epistemic standing to, to make the claim. And then there are these second order norms, which is, you know, assertion has to be apt, it has to be sort of believed to be true or something along that line. So, um, so it doesn't matter necessarily whether I am actually right or I am actually justified. What matters is that like, I sincere, it's like a sincerity point. I, I really take myself to be true or justified and I, I believe these things. Um, and so these are sort of, most of the norms we found all found in these, um, fell into these categories. As we got to thinking, is it the case that like, in the good case, and not necessarily in every case, but in, in the good case, scientific papers, the conclusions of the public avowals in particular um, would fall into one of these categories and we're going to argue um, that they don't. Okay. Okay, so here's the super rushed um, uh, case study, but just to say, you know, um, the, the, the reason I still include this partly because um, you know, just to mention it, but also partly um, because if you're interested in this, uh, the paper goes into far more detail and there is a completed um, document available. It's not published yet, but um, it is available. 
And so we're happy to send it. And in fact, because it's not published, it would be useful to get comments and stuff. That's good. Okay, so the um, the case study, such as it is, is about uh, William Henry Bragg and x-rays. And so in the early 20th century, there was uh, a lot of research um, among physicists on what we would now think of as x-rays. And people were sort of trying to work out what they are and what causes them. And uh, Bragg in 1907, actually in a series of papers, um, argued that x-rays must have a particle component, that they must, these particles must be composed of, of particles in some sense. Um, however, um, he was wrong. Like it turned out the thing we know about x-rays, he was wrong about what made him up, his theory was just incorrect. So this, his work where he was kind of putting this theory forward, um, his conclusions, his sign of coupling vowels, they weren't true. And so uh, they weren't, they weren't, they wouldn't have meet, they would have been bad according to effective norm. Um, now they weren't justified. Now here's what we mean by that. Um, and it's actually relevant to the second one. Um, Bragg was kind of well aware that the sum total, like sum total evidence uh, didn't favor his claim. Like uh, he was getting results suggestive of a particle component, um, but he was well aware that there was uh, other work going on. And on the whole, it, it didn't justify his conclusion. Like on the whole, the evidence spoke against it. But despite that in, in public, he, he made his claims at a particle component. And we know there was this difference between his public assertions and his, well, his public scientific public vows and his private attitudes because he, we actually have a bunch of diaries and correspondence of his, which is kind of what makes this nice and uh, I think we're very well informed about, where he just says, um, you know, he, he, he admits to these things and, and he says, well, I'm putting the idea out there because someone should defend this and it'd be worth like seeing how the community responds, like, but, you know, even if I'm wrong, it will be worth uh, worth seeing how people respond. And like someone has to explain my experimental results. And so I'm going to put forward the best case I can. And and, and so like because we have this, actually, you know, he, he didn't he didn't really believe what he was um, putting forward. And um, he he it wasn't fully justified given the total evidence, at least by his own appraisal. And we're not going to disagree with that. So given total evidence about the state of research on on the what we now call X-rays. Um, it wasn't justified and, and, and he didn't leave it to be truly justified. Um, and importantly for our purpose, he got a Nobel Prize. Um, and just, like he didn't get a Nobel Prize for this work in particular, he got a Nobel Prize for something slightly later, but that was kind of indicative of the fact that um, everyone viewed this to be a sort of a very successful episode in science is still taught as a generally like, you know, science well done. Uh, no one has ever read his correspondence, found out that, you know, he, the kind of arguments he was making where he sort of kind of didn't really believe it to be true or justified and thought he was somehow like sinning against scientific propriety. The community at the time certainly didn't view his advocacy for this theory as inappropriate or the work as bad in virtue of being false or not being justified in total evidence. And so it seems that um, Bragg remained an outstanding member of the community, despite the fact that he was putting forward these avowals, which were neither true nor justified nor believed to be as such by that author. Um, and so it seems that therefore this is kind of a, a, an interesting case where someone was able to sort of reliably go forward making making claims, making these avowals about x-rays having a particle component, um, which wouldn't have met any of the norms of assertion. They'd be inapt, infelicitous, bad qua assertions. But they weren't viewed to be kind of like bad qua contributions to science, bad qua scientific public avowals, bad qua things to conclude in the scientific paper by either their members of his community or as far as we can tell, subsequent historians or people looking back on the episode. And so, um, you know, that's interesting to us, at least in at least this case, it seems like, uh, you know, it turns out you can be a perfectly good avowal according to the norms of the scientific community and and not, not be good, not be kosher according to the the, the norms analytic philosophers have surveyed for assertions. Um, and then and so then the question was, does this generalize? And like, well, wouldn't have a talk or paper if the answer wasn't yes. The answer is yes. Um, and but like if you, if when we're gonna think about why it generalizes, I think that's gonna that's gonna be sort of like telling is like it's because of the kind of thing science is as a social enterprise that like that Bragg's behavior here really was like exemplary qua um, 
participant in the scientific enterprise, despite the fact that he was regularly putting forward claims which, which, which didn't meet the standards. And so, and, and thinking about like why that is, it's like really where the interest of the paper lies, so we claim. Okay, so I had an assumption to justify this. So like, you know, one of the things we just relied on in that was the claim that, uh, like how do we know Bragg's norm, so the claims weren't just bad claims to make, they were inept, they were infelicitous. Well, we said because both the scientists at the time and subsequent historians seem to sort of judge Bragg well, no one ever thinks this episode to his discredit, even though we have these letters available to him um, and, and correspondence available from him. But we think there's a more a general play here when you think about what it is for something to be a, a norm for public avowals or speech norm in general. And we're gonna assume that a, a good norm for public avowals can't uh, rule out as bad or sort of say uh, infelicitous things that would be necessary for scientific communication. Um, so it can't be the case that like, I, I, you know, to be a good member, to like do the things which this community needs me to do in order to carry out projects, I need to tell you this. But for the norm for making those assertions, I shouldn't tell you this. We're gonna assume that the norms are kind of like well adapted to their function in the community. They're well adapted to like the social role they should play in in regulating the discourse among scientists. Um, so that's, that's an assumption we're making. Um, and that's why we're gonna, and that's we'll say that for instance, and we're gonna argue that it turns out the reason you can, you can violate, um, you can violate the norms of assertion that Adam's philosophers have surveyed is because um, it, it, it's good for the enterprise as a whole, that kind of norm functionalism is kind of undergirding our arguments. Um, I should say, in the interest of fairness, this has turned out to be the point where when we show this to analytic epistemologists, they, they push back on this a lot. Like it actually is not taken as granted that, um, that the norm has to be well adapted to the community in this way. So yeah, maybe we can discuss that. I'm not sure what I think about it, but that's our assumption in this paper. Okay. So one of the things going on in the Bragg case um, is that, oh, I'm kind of shaking, moving around in my chair. This is much nicer than giving talks in person. I love it. Okay. Um, the, um, one of the things going on in the Bragg case is um, Bragg and other scientists, it turned out they were using different materials to generate the x-rays but we, uh, or generate yeah the x-rays but it and that made a difference to what they were seeing and that explained why they were getting different results but at the time people didn't know that this difference would make a difference and so like it took doing this kind of work to sort it out and so like this is an example of the kind of the division of labor we had um different scientists worked on different materials and in that way we were able to specialize and, and get give different results and that was on the whole informative and that's that's a general feature of science where we um, divide cognitive labor and we have different people explore different well, experimental procedures in this case or different models or different theories and um, by dividing themselves up in this way we're better able to um, explore I mean it, this is one of the sort of core arguments people in social epistemology have been making for a while now in the social studies of science that this kind of division of labor this um, exploring different things taking different models or theories as your background assumptions etc that that's really what allows for the success of science. It's like really vital that we we do this thing. Like it's it's how it is that science can uh, achieve whatever it achieves when it's successful um, is by allowing for this specialization and rapid and wide reaching exploration of logical space. But like a sort of inevitable consequences of this is like either because they're directly just making different theoretical or modeling assumptions and then we sort of directly what they're saying will contradict or because of the kind of thing we're doing when we're doing science if you have different experimental procedures sometimes that will give you systematically different results or things indicative of different claims but inevitably you're going to have people contradicting or disagreeing with each other they, you, they're going to come to different results or make different assumptions or in general their their claims will either directly contradict or quickly entail contradictions um, and that's normal and that, that's that's not only normal but it, it, it's vital and so at least some of these people assuming the invidious um, principle of non-contradiction, which I wrote for now. But um, at least some of these people therefore have to be wrong, right? Because, because they're asserting P and not P, so at least one person has to be wrong. Um, and so um, if we're right that the division of labor is vital um, and uh, given our previous norm, and this is, this is kind of a generalization of what's going in the Bragg case, if this is always going to be the case, then at least we have to put up with at least some people violating the fact of norm. We won't be able to identify who's doing it, but at least someone has to be violating the fact of norm because that's just a kind of inevitable upshot of the division of labor. 
which is a kind of vital part of science. And so we have to be willing to say, you can like be doing good work and doing exactly what we need you to do for the community to make its epistemic advances, um, even though sometimes some, you're gonna say false things or some proportion of you are, are gonna be saying false things. And so we think that like this is, um, this is an example for where the defective norms are going to go wrong. And it's like maybe I'll bring up here that you could like maybe see the pessimistic meta induction um, as kind of another version of this. It's kind of like the division of labor, but temporally spread rather than spread over space or logical space. So like maybe like you could see the pessimistic meta induction is like the best way we have of like advancing in science is by allotting different generations the task of exploring different bits of logical space and it's only by them doing what they can do making the mistakes they make and us disagreeing with them that we uh we can make whatever advances we can make and and presumably some of the things we're seeing will be mistakes in just this kind of way and so if you do buy a pessimistic meta induction it's kind of it's it's a version of the same point um that uh Oh wait, I just realized I don't know what you I don't know what I can assume from the audience here. So just for people aware, the pessimistic meta induction is this general argument that um very often scientists will be saying false things, and it's just basically an induction on the history of science. If you look at all of the, the great science of the past, people have pre frequently been saying things which turn out to be false, um, but which they weren't able to realize as false at the time, which their evidence seems to be supporting. And the claim is probably we're in the same situation. And so we're saying what can be seen as underlying that is a similar kind of division of labor point, or at least if anything like that is true then it looks like we kind of we've just accepted that um some false things are going to be said as part of the process of science going well oh no i saw the q a thing just light it up i don't hold me to the pessimistic meta induction I'll, I'll back down immediately okay right um but like okay so you've got the division of conflict labor point and you've maybe got the pessimistic meta induction point depending on what you think of that there might even be the same point um, but then and that gets rid of the fact of norms, right? Because that just shows some people have to be saying false things for us to be doing well. Um, and I think the next issue though, which also gets rid of the justification norms is um, evidence, like a, a principle governing what counts as being justified or being warranted, like whatever it would be to meet the epistemic norms, we, we include the total evidence principle. It's like, whether or not your claim is justified is really whether or not it's justified relative to all of the evidence, so not just the evidence you've gathered, like, like in, as in Bragg's case, but also what other people in the field are doing. In um, hotly contested um, cutting edge science, often that will be, that will, of, that the kind of the total evidence available to you, both about the kind of process scientific inquiry is, um, and also about what your peers are, are doing right now, um, that can sort of overwhelm your local evidence that, that that may well happen. In which case, like, you know, for you to publish anything kind of, there would always be a weight of evidence against you. Um, that in fact kind of happened to Brad and it, it can happen plenty of other times too. You could also be looking for something where, you know, you know there's a lot of noise and the best methods we have are only gonna be so good at um, cutting through that. Um, and again, sort of, we, we don't know how to do better than everyone putting out their studies and then trying to do meta studies later. So these are situations where, which is pretty normal, where like scientists' total evidence um, will sort of outweigh their particular evidence and speak against whatever conclusion they're coming to. But the only way we'll sort of eventually be in a position to do better is by people still putting forward their claims and like learning from learning from each of the individual subunits and how they um, see what they found and then think about like what the total evidence suggests in light of this later. And so often scientists in the position of putting forward a new claim will find the total evidence outweighs them. That's what happened to Bragg, and and we think that's that's fine. That that's that's okay. Um, so just as like it can be perfectly fine to end up saying a false thing because we did the division of labor and you got unlucky, so too it can be totally okay to say something which isn't justified given your evidence or isn't warranted given the evidence available, um, because like you know we're engaged in this cutting edge research. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of new things being found out, etc. And any one thing can't really contribute that much justification. And so we think that's a perfectly fine situation too. And that will means the, there'll be plenty of sort of perfectly acceptable scientific public avowals, which uh, would be, wouldn't meet the um, epistemic norms either. Um, okay. Uh, the next thing is kind of existential thing. So we've got those two things. We've got an argument saying, uh, given a good division of cognitive labor, both spatially and temporally, Often people are going to say false things, but it'll be fine. 
uh, given again the digital cognitive labor, um, but also given some facts about like what it's like to do cutting edge research. Often people will be saying things outweighed by total evidence, and that's fine. And then the last thing is that we it really is a kind of existential point. It, it's that we don't think that there can be a requirement that science it can't be normatively required. This is an extra assumption. Maybe we should list this at the front, but like we don't think it can be like normatively required that scientists be like arrogant or ignorant of the history or state of their field, right? Like they, they, you know, there's that claim that uh you know, everyone thinks they're a better than average driver, right? Like we don't think that's like normatively required of scientists that everyone thinks that, you know, RIP Newton, but my theories are different. Like uh, that, that my work is um, is going to be the exception to the pessimist metro induction or like I'm just lucky and it's always the case that like the thing my lab group doing is going to turn out to be the correct one or et cetera. They can be perfectly aware and still normatively correct as Bragg was that like, well, you know, I'm exploring a new thing and the evidence is kind of, all over the place right now but you know i'm going to put forward this claim because it's what we seem to be finding and it's good for it to, it's good for this sort of this claim to have an advocate in light of the fact that some of this is out there supporting it like that's a perfectly fine way to be it it's not normatively required that you don't be the way now it's not normative well we don't think it's normatively required to be making good scientific avowals that you don't be that way you know <laughs> There are, there are some arrogant scientists I've heard, and there, there are some scientists who are ignorant of the history or sociology of science, allegedly. And if these things are true, we're not saying that therefore they can never make good public avowals, but we're just saying that it's not normally required that you don't be that way. And so, you know, th this is, these are the kind of things which um, got, us, got us through this. Like, so we just, when we were thinking about these public avowals, we thought that like, they, they can be perfectly good, um, Signing public claims, public avowals, which aren't true. There can be ones which are perfectly good, but which aren't justified. And there can be perfectly ones which, like the, the the people making them, know them not to be or don't believe them to be true or justified. Um, and 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 allowing for that turns out to be sort of like vital for science to be able to do what it's doing. Like if we were to sort of count that against you, then what we'd be saying is that things which have to happen for science to go well aren't aren't. Are still bad like you shouldn't have done them according to this norm um and we don't think the the norm of a vow should sort of mitigate against some purpose in that way so no we're not saying of course that all claims made by um made in conclusion the scientific public vows we're not saying they're all false or all unjustified or all not believed uh, we're just saying that it's permissible for them to be and so sometimes they will be and so even when things are going well you can't infer from the fact that, that something was published that it is true or justified or even believed. I mean, that's kind of interesting for me if some study is fraud, but even believed, I don't think you can, you can infer that. And so sort of when you're thinking about what kind of science um, should be reliable or what you can trust or work on the basis of, you have to do sort of more. I mean, it's kind of obvious in some sense, but like it's, it's why it's true. It's like you have to do more than just go from what's been published and before you can, you know, you can trust it. And that's because like science requires that it be the sort of enterprise that, um, that allows for such things, if, if we're right about the division of labor and whatnot, this importance. Okay, so there's a, an objection which we thought about a lot, and I'm not really sure I agree with our answer to, but like, I'll, I'll run it past you, see what you think, um, which, which might come, which is that like, shouldn't scientists just make more cautious claims, right? So, like, rather than saying, uh, mobile phone use went up in Accra in 2007. What they should say is something like, our data suggests mobile phone went up in, mobile phone use went up in Accra in 2007. Um, and that claim might be true or justified or at least believed, right? Um, and so uh, if they were to just kind of like appropriately epistemically hedge their utterances or appropriately hedge them by means of relating them to, to other claims, then maybe they, maybe you could get something more like the traditional claims going. Um, and so yeah, that, that's an objection one might have. As th there's a couple of things to say to that. One which is, I think, more boring, I'll say it, and then there's some more So the more boring one is just to lean on um, what I was just saying about the fact that, you know, we're not saying that all, all, all utterances have to be untrue, unjustified, or not believed, just that they can be, and it's okay. And, you know, and informally, we surveyed a bunch of journals, and we, we found some, some people would, in their abstracts, or in the, in the results section, sometimes in the discussion section, 
say things in the hedge kind of way, we hypothesize, um, our data suggests, um, it seems that, things like that. Uh, it, it seems that it's a bit dodgy, but like for the other two, at least. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, some people would just make claims along the lines of in 2007, mobile phone use went up in a crowd. Like there was also that kind of unhedged claim. And all we're saying is that like those stronger claims, even if they're not true just for that, that can be permissible because it serves this purpose of communicating results for doing that. And so that would be to, to sort of the kind of boring response. But that's not for the, that's a bit boring. And also you might think, well, the, the availability of these hedge claims kind of undermines the claim it's strictly necessary to make a stronger claim. And, and, and I think that kind of gets to the more interesting point here, which is, okay. So to some extent, it gets to like, without, I'm, I'm yet to find a way of saying this, which, which I like, but uh, you know, what, what matters is like the risky utterance. Um, and that's what we need, the content of a risky utterance. And that's what we need to be communicated and tested. Like what's vital for science isn't this one lab, this one time, got something which seems to suggest this, or like these sociologists hang around pawn shops in Accra, so, so like this many people come in this month in 2007. Um, what we're interested in is the general claim, right? We're interested in mobile phone use or we're interested in x-rays or, or whatever it might be. Um, or like, you know, so like the kind of thing which prompted the replication crisis, right? Like it wouldn't matter if some undergrad sometime got more confident after they power post. Oh, you can't see, I was power posting, but just trust me. Um, it, what matters was the claim, there's a general relationship between like um, positioning your body in this kind of way and, and, and one confident in one one's performance. Um, and so kind of, so to speak, like even the apparently hedged forms of the claim, what they're communicating, the thing that's necessary for science is, is that, it's, it's the general claim. It's like the work they do is getting people to focus their attention on, on that claim. And what we're saying is kind of that claim, the thing which we actually care about, the thing which is most, the thing which is like what we're really trying to get at, whether we, whether we kind of like give the outer form of hedging or not, um, that claim turns out to be true, um, justified or, or believed to be such. And we think that's kind of more interesting. It, it wouldn't really, you could sort of get something which would like, yeah, okay, technically you said a true thing or something which might be justified if you made the hedge claim, but it doesn't matter because what we're gonna do is not like, if we're gonna try and replicate this, for instance, we're not gonna see whether or not you really believed the, the hedge claim or whether, uh, well, unless we're worried about fraud, we're probably not gonna be looking for like whether your data in particular really justified this. Rather what we're gonna be looking for is whether this can be supported in other cases or whether we should come to believe it, so to speak. And so that's why, so basically we think that objection that shouldn't they make hedge claims, um, it kind of sort of misses the point. It, it changes the subject somehow. It, it's um, too focused on the, the outer form of the words rather than the, the, the role in the community, the, the communication that they're actually trying to give past. Let's see what you think. Um, okay, so I think, let's see how long has it been? Oh, so it's been about 50 minutes, so 45 minutes, that's okay. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're doing close, we're coming close to the bit where we conclude that Heisen and I are correct. So get ready for that. But before that, we say a bit, which is positive as well. We're trying to think about um, like what we think is going on here instead. Like if there is a norm or we can try and characterize it, which we had a go. So we said, you know, the overall moral is that the social enterprise of inquiry requires we allow people to be more lax in certain contexts we normally require of individuals offering testimony. And for a long process of cultural evolution, a community has developed norms of vow to accommodate that fact. So here's what you mean by that. You, you know, you, you might think that science is really naturally seen as a place where um, we are we, we hold people to higher standards, right? Like it's the it's the strict epistemic enterprise. And in a sense, that's true. But like I think that the we has to be taken seriously. Collectively, science is a place with very high standards. But the way it does that is it turns out by like, to some extent, like letting people like epistemically get away with making utterances, which in a sense is they wouldn't be allowed to. So the reason we think Alex Flossers have often had these kind of factive or epistemic norms um, is because they're thinking of paradigm assumptions being something like, I ask you when the bus is coming and you tell me. And if you do that, you didn't know when the bus is coming, you've you failed me, you've been misleading in some way, like that's the kind of situation. But in, 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 in inquiry, actually we can't require that of you because like the, it, if we already knew in that way, it wouldn't be inquiry. Um, 
And so it just turns out that kind of in a certain sense, you, we actually kind of lower the standards in a certain sense for scientific public avowals. The question number is going up again. This is awful. It's so scary. This is way more terrifying. I take it back. I don't like online trolls. Um, so, um, uh, so right, so yeah, so that, that's what we think is going on. Um, and and we, we think, as I said, it's kind of functional. Something. Like we think that like gradually what's happened is given that inquiry needs this to be successfully, successfully carried out, gradually the community has kind of come up with patterns of what is accepted and not accepted, which kind of respect the fact that sort of taking epistemic risks, you know, bold conjectures in, in proper sense are like are okay in in in, in this context. And so our kind of tentative proposal for what a norm which would work would be, this is just awful, but I'm gonna read out anyway. One's avowal must be such that if one's evidence or what would have to, if one's evidence or what one had gathered in, in a methodologically proper way for one's latest study, combined with whatever the mandated subset of the previous literature contains, then one would be justified in believing one's scientific public avowal. So it's a kind of limited epistemic norm, where the idea is you get to like pretend, hypothetically suppose your total evidence were just the evidence you've recently gathered, assuming you've done it properly, and different fields of different norms, but like some subset of the previous literature which you're expected to survey in the previous work section of your paper. So suppose all of your evidence were that, then would you be justified in coming to whatever conclusion you did? Now, in fact, you know, your evidence won't be that. Oh, to that won't be your total evidence because you might know about other work going on or um, you might have other studies going on even at a different time. So that, that needn't be your total evidence, but you like pretend that's your total evidence. And you're also allowed to ignore like the pessimistic matter induction. You don't have to worry about like the overall history of science or something. Um, then you have to pass an epistemic set, uh, bar, an epistemic uh, standard to make your avowal on this kind of hypothetical, fictitious total evidence. Uh, that's, that's what we think. That's our sort of proposal, I guess. For what like you can infer and so like when it was going well what you can infer is something like uh this claim um, would be justified by this kind of imagined total evidence set and there'll be some work to do for like different fields will like have there's a couple of th things that which are sort of like free variables so to speak where different fields will have different things for what counts as methodologically proper or different uh the mandated subset of the previous literature um, different fields will fill those things in differently, and, and that's why you can get some diversity between scientific fields as well. So that's our proposal for what the norm actually is. Um, just to hear what you think. And, and we think that if this were more widely appreciated, it might help with some reflection on scientific communication, SciComm. And we think, as I said, just because what initially prompted this was thinking about the uh, about the replication crisis, and we think that what might be good is for people for science journalists and maybe like members of the business community who might be taken in by scientists selling them consultancies they probably shouldn't buy. Is if people who do it, like, you know, look, even when things are going well, like this is what an individual study gets you, right? Like, you know, value that as you will, respond to it, like that's what you should be responding to because like that, that, that's what it gets you in, in the good case. That's what you can infer as a non-expert seeing it. And that's also why I think it might be appropriate to like actually require people to be more explicit, like not let them get away of saying things which are meeting this strange norm if they're talking to the public, but they have to say, there it does matter that they say like the hedge thing with the appropriate explanation of how it's created. So it has to be sort of true or known maybe, um, because the public not being, not being part of the community which has um, developed these norms will not necessarily know how to respond to it correctly unless it's said explicitly. And so we, we hope that if this work is developed then eventually it could it could have some sort of beneficial results for how we train science journalists or science communicators or, some, or people who regularly ex um, interact with people like that. Okay, so we asked what sort of epistemic relationship to, should we have to conclusions of individual scientific papers um, and also think about like, you know, really how do scientific papers individually relate to the enterprise of science as a whole. Um, we, we argued that we don't think they have to be true justified or believed to be such, even in the best case. So that was even under our idealizing assumption about things going well. And we don't think they have to meet the typical norms of assertion surveyed in analytic epistemology. Uh, but rather they're justified to this kind of like field specific conventionally specified subset of our total evidence. Um, and that, that's, that's the situation. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? I think I'm done now. Uh,
All right, thank you, Liam, uh, for this uh, wonderful and uh, provocative talk. Um, so let me remind you how we're going to be proceeding. Um, what, if you have a question, please.